Texas Lutheran University. It's awesome to see so much discussion around this uh, and so much involvement from y'all. Um, the last session that we have today uh, gives us kind of some kind of ancillary views uh, from those uh, directly involved in a lot of discussions that we've had. Um, we've got four panelists here from, from different areas. Um, first, we've got Dr. Mark Cousins, who's the current Director of Compliance for the University Interscholastic League, or the UIL. He's also the former Athletic Director uh, for the UIL. We've got Mr. Harold Thib Thibodeau, who is a nurse and a critical care manager. He's also a, a TBI, traumatic brain injury recovery su support specialist through the DVBIC uh, in Sam San Antonio. Uh, Ms. Monica Matoka, who's a, a lecturer in the athletic training department at Texas State University. Uh, she also has a history of um, being an athletic trainer at, uh, at the high school level. And then Mr. Joel Hicks, who's a former medic from the, uh, the Air Force, correct? Uh, also a TLU graduate who actually has suffered and continues uh, to deal with the effects of traumatic brain injury. Um, so I'm going to let each one of them kind of uh, talk to you from their angle and, and how their expertise and their, their jobs relate to this larger discussion. And then we're going to open it up to the floor for questions that you may have for any of them. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, share some information. Again, my name is Mark Cousins. Uh, I am currently Director of Compliance, Eligibility, and Education for UIL. I've been at UIL in some form or fashion for about 20 years. Uh, done all kinds of jobs from Assistant Athletic Director to Director of Policy, Director of Athletics, uh, dealing with the State Legislature and dealing with our Medical Advisory Committee. Uh, we formed the committee back in 2001 uh, to address health and safety uh, concerns for our participants across the state in extracurricular athletic activities. Uh, our organization is a little over 105 years old. Uh, we've been around uh, organizing those activities uh, since early in the 1900s, 1913 to be exact. Uh, since that time, uh, we've had just untold number of student athletes participate in our activities. Currently, we have around 1,400 high schools uh, that are members of our association. Uh, about 1,300 or a little over 1,300 of those participate in athletic competition. Uh, each year at the junior high and the high school level, well over one million student athletes take part in our activities. Uh, and so trying to make sure that we have policies in place to protect the health and safety of those uh, young participants is something that our organization has really tried to focus on uh, even before the Medical Advisory Committee was formed back in 2001. Uh, I've been a staff liaison to that committee since 2001 when, uh, when, when it began. And it began really with a focus on four different areas. Uh, we called them the four H's at that time. Uh, obviously, the first one and the one that's particular here is the head. So talking about concussions and head injuries and how to look at those and, and react to those. Uh, the history, uh, which is the physical examination and medical history process to make sure that students, when they show up to participate, uh, are uh, not uh, exhibiting any particular uh, health concerns. So we have those looked at by physicians and by the athletic trainers at the school. Uh, the heart. Uh, certainly cardiac issues, uh, you could spend just as much time uh, talking about cardiac issues as you do head injuries. Uh, and then heat, uh, everybody knows in Texas it gets a little hot every now and then, uh, even in October when it's 90 degrees. Uh, in a lot of places they're starting to get their fall gear out. Here in Texas it's still 90 degrees and heat is still a big issue. Uh, so the issue of concussions has been at the forefront of, of what we've done at UIL, so in my time at least, and even before that. Uh, it really became on the radar for us back in 2003 when our medical advisory committee recommended uh, a concussion management protocol to our schools uh, based on at that time what was called the standardized assessment of concussions. Uh, two years later in 2005, uh, they mandated a concussion management protocol for all athletic activities in grades 7 through 12. Uh, at that time it was uh, based on the recommendations of the American Academy of Neurology and the Brain Injury Association of America. And, and at that time it was based on grades of concussions. Uh, back then, concussions were graded out as grade one, grade two, or grade three. And depending on uh, what the symptoms were and what the, was observed by the, the person that was evaluating that student, uh, their return to play was based on how their concussion was graded out. 
Uh, we had that in place for a number of years, and then around 2009, 2010, uh, research began to emerge that, that there was becoming increasing agreement that maybe the grades of concussion uh, weren't the particular way that that needed to be looked at. Uh, so our medical advisor committee began to reevaluate our protocol. At that time, there was work being done by the National Federation of State High School Associations, uh, that is the national organization for high school associations such as the UIL. They also have a sports medicine uh, advisory committee that I'm currently a member of. Uh, and at that time, they began to reevaluate and provide uh, high schools across the nation uh, with a protocol that was a little bit different uh, than the grades of concussion. It, it was pretty much uh, a, a really shift to if there was even a suspicion or anyone sus had suspicion that a student had sustained a concussion that they needed to be removed and evaluated at that time. Uh, and one of the big things that they talked about that time is a pretty short statement. I think you've probably heard a lot uh, over the last few years is when in doubt, sit them out. Uh, that, that if there was a concern uh, that, that they needed to be removed from participation and evaluated. And then their return to play uh, was more focused on a gradual or stepwise progression back to participation rather than a full return right off the bat. Uh, so our medical advisory committee was looking at that. They had also at that time put in place some practice restrictions. Obviously that's important for heat related illnesses, uh, but it's also important uh, for contact levels. So we put time limits on the amount of time they were allowed to practice. Uh, we put in rules and regulations that said that you could not have consecutive days of multiple practices. So if your school had two practices on one day in football, uh, the next day they can only have one. Uh, also, during that time, there was a lot of concern and movement in the legislature and, and in state legislatures all across this nation. Uh, and so in 2011 and 2012, uh, the legislature did pass a bill. Uh, it was House Bill 2038. It's sometimes referred to in, in the literature as Natasha's Law. And what that did is mandate that every school district across the state had to develop what was called a concussion oversight team, which means every school district, their school board, had to appoint individuals. Uh, the, the least amount of people it could be was one, which had to be a physician. Uh, but then, depending on the resources available in that community and what, their, what had, was available in their area, they were also encouraged to also put on neuropsychologists, also neurologists. And if their school district employed an athletic trainer, uh, the athletic trainer needed to be a part of that concussion oversight team. And what that concussion oversight team was tasked with was to develop a return to play protocol for that particular school district. Uh, and what the law said is specifically that any student who was suspected of receiving a head injury must be removed immediately and would not be allowed to return to participation until they had been evaluated and cleared by a physician of their choosing. And then they had begun and gone through the return to play protocol that had been established by that school district. We've been working under that uh, law now since 2012. A couple other things I think that were very important as part of that law is one is education. Uh, coaches uh, are required to undergo concussion education. Uh, they're required to have two hours of concussion every education every two years. And more specifically, not just coaches are being educated, but also parents and students are being educated. The law also required that prior to a student's participation uh, in a UIL athletic activity, that they had to read and sign a form that specifically provided information about what actually the definition of concussion is, which I think the panelists and some of the people you've heard from over the last two days, there's not a lot of agreement on what the actual definition of a concussion is, uh, but also what signs and symptoms are, possible little ways to prevent, uh, and then specific information as in the law, as in what occurs when a student is suspected of having a concussion and what they must do in order to return to play. Uh, so since 2012, our schools uh, have been working under that law. From every, uh, all the aspects that we've seen, our schools are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, our coaches are educated. Uh, our parents and students have received more information in reference to that. But our medical advisor committee and our group has continued uh, to look into this issue and try to find more ways to make our activities as safe as they can be. One of the things that our medical advisory committee has done since that time uh, is extended the information on concussions and the requirements uh, of House Bill 2038 and extended that to participants in cheerleading and spirit competition. Uh, all athletes are currently under the law as it was passed. 
but then specifically our superintendents and our medical advisory committee felt uh, that the participants in cheerleading and spirit competitions uh, were just as susceptible to head injuries and concussions in the activities they participated in as athletes were. Uh, so we extended that requirement to them as well. And then particularly, even though uh, concussions do not only occur in football, uh, it is uh, the activity where we have the most contact. So we've continued to look at issues surrounding contact in football. Uh, back in 2013, we were one of the first states in the nation to actually require a limit on the amount of time that football players were allowed to uh, participate in full contact practice during the regular season. Uh, they're, not, they're not allowed to participate in more than 90 minutes of full contact practice uh, during, the, during the regular season. And we continue to review uh, our rules and regulations on practice requirements uh, to look at ways that we can uh, eliminate or reduce contact in practice. Uh, there's no way to do it for g contests and games, but we can continue to look at ways to do it in practice. The most recent thing that we're looking at now is a recommendation, at least discussion from our medical committee in reference to our spring practices for football at our two largest classifications, 5A and 6A. Currently, they can do 18 practices over 30 consecutive calendar days. Uh, we are beginning discussion with our medical advisory committee and representatives of our coaches associations to look at cutting back those practices from 18 to 15. Uh, so this is an issue that has been at the forefront of UIL uh, for the last number of years, at least since 2001 when that medical advisory committee was put together. Uh, and it is something that's going to continue to be at the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, we are never going to make our activities 100% safe. Uh, it, it's just a, a fact that when you have contact activities, and again, it's not just football. Uh, uh, soccer is also a place where concussions occur. Spirit, we talked about that, but it can be any activity. Uh, we've seen concussions in volleyball. We've seen concussions in tennis. Uh, so it's something that we need to make sure we have our students educated about what's going on. But the key thing is having rules and regulations in place that our schools and coaches are aware of uh, and we continue to move forward on. But the key thing that you hear from our office and you hear from coaches and athletic trainers across the state is that pretty simple statement about concussions. When in doubt, sit it out. Uh, there is nothing uh, that, that is as important as making sure that if you do have a head injury that you do not return to play prior to the time uh, that, that you're able to do so. And then lastly, the other part of what we're looking at uh, is making sure not only the health of the student but the academic participation uh, and return to learn and trying to educate our schools and counselors of the proper way to reintegrate those athletes with concussions back into the academic setting as well. So uh, we're going to continue to work with that, and thank you for your time, and appreciate the opportunity to come share some information. Good morning. Is this, is this on? You hear me? Okay. Good morning. My name is Harold Thibodeau. I'm a registered nurse, certified case manager. I work for the Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center. It's the lead component for TBI for the Defense Center of Excellence for Traumatic Brain Injury and Psychological Health. I'm sorry, I hope you all heard that. Um, basically what I like to do is I do everything for the service member or the veteran. The only, uh, the only prerequisite to uh, getting into this program is that you've had a concussion or, a, or some type of brain injury. When I say I, I try to do everything, I realize that if you can't pay your mortgage or you have a sick child and you, you don't have any health insurance, your memory's not gonna get any better, your anxiety issues aren't gonna get any better. So we try to uh, solve the uh, issues on the periphery to see what, you, what we're left with and so we can get that treated. I work, uh, I like to say I follow you from Fort Bragg to Fort Lee Room. I'm a, my uh, background is I joined the Army when I was 17. My dad grabbed me by my, pony hell, uh, my ponytail and stuck me in the recruiter's uh, chair and told me to put me in the military. So I, it was a lifesaver for me. It changed my life. But as a result, I, being an airborne uh, pathfinder infantry guy, I got a lot of concussions down the road. Uh, separated my shoulders, broke all the metatarsals in my right foot. I've been knocked out several times. Uh, back then when I was in, bar fights were considered good training. I can't tell you how many bar bottles and pull sticks I've taken. Uh, but what we try to do with this program is we have a real good relationship with the VA. Uh, I work at SAMC. Uh, I was a co-chair for the Military and Veterans uh, Committee for the uh, Office of the Acquired Brain Injury for the state of Texas, working on veterans and uh, military issues for about five years. I've worked closely with Ms. Uh, Susanna Hupp. Uh, for you all don't know Ms. Susanna Hupp, she's the reason that you can concealed carry here in the state of Texas. She was at Luby's in Waco 
and her parents were killed, and she said if she would have had her gun, she could have taken the guy out, and that would have been an issue. She later became a state senator and is now uh, the commissioner for the uh, Veteran and Military Affairs uh, Committee. Thank you. I'm Monica Matoka, and I think the Texas state laws have already been spoken to pretty well, so I won't reiterate all of those. Texas is very unique in the way athletic trainers are employed in quite a few of the high schools um, here in the state. If you go other places, there's not athletic trainers at a lot of the high schools, and unfortunately, the patients are the ones that, are, that get the wrong end of that. Um, there was recently, there's been quite a few deaths in high school football this year. Um, and unfortunately, the latest one, it didn't sound like there was actually an athletic trainer there. And one of the problems with that, I won't want to say a problem with athletic training is, but nobody really knows what an athletic trainer does. It's really hard to get other people to understand everything that we do. Because usually what they see is someone that is carrying water. Oh, so you're the, the water boy or the water girl. There's a lot more to athletic training behind the scenes that you don't see. And unfortunately, those that don't understand what we do really don't un understand the importance of having athletic trainers around. Athletic trainers look at sports in a unique fashion. How many of you, just by a show of hands, have ever watched like a highlight video of like on YouTube or something of like the worst hits in football or something like that? How many of you? Quite a few of you, okay. Now, how many of you, whenever you saw the hit, you went, oh my goodness, that was awesome. Did you see them? They just laid that person out. How many of you, raise your hand, were looking at, you said that, okay. The, uh, has anybody ever paid attention to the person they actually hit, okay. Athletic trainers are paying attention to that other person. It is their job to notice what's going on. So they have a different viewpoint of practices and games, and that's what they're there for, okay? So I challenge you next time you watch one of those videos, watch the other person that is in the video that just got hit, okay? And you can look for posturing, you can look for whether they lost consciousness. There's a lot of things that you can look for. Did they stumble, did they not? And asking them, are you okay, is not sufficient enough to determine if they have a brain injury or not. There was a, I had a fellow athletic trainer that was at working soccer. And it was at the high school. The ref told, the, asked the, the patient, who was the goalie that just got kicked in the head, trying to save, make a save, and said, hey, are you okay? As most athletes say, yeah, I'm fine. The athletic trainer, the edited version was saying, no, I'm going to come out on the field anyways, because the ref was trying to say, no, you stay on the sideline. The athletic trainer went and did her evaluation, sent him to the hospital, and he had a subdural hematoma. She saved his life. Okay? So asking a patient, are you okay, is not enough. And athletic trainers are there to protect you. Patients get upset. Coaches get upset. But you have to, as an athletic trainer, we are the ones that have to step in and do what's best for you. In the end, it is just a game. And you have to think about, what are you going to do when you're 60 years old? Hello, my name is Joel Hicks. And uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm a... a Air Force veteran. I was a medic in the Air Force. Um, I'd like to start off by saying I, I, I received my first trauma at six weeks old. Um, I was born in 1968, and it was about this time because I was born August 13th, and so about the 1st of October, um, my mom was holding me. We didn't have car seat restrictions. A lot of seat belts and vehicles back then, and um, I received this scar right here that's on my head at that time because we were rear-ended and I struck my head. What I'm trying to get at with that is 
the head trauma thing is, is something that um, there's still a lot of, of information, a lot of questions to be answered. Um, but going on from that, that, that's when I first started uh, having head traumas. I was very athletic as a child. I played soccer, um, played football, played baseball, rode dirt bikes, um, rode BMX, rode skateboards. And so I, I had my fair share of, of head trauma. Um, I had my fair share of head, head traumas throughout my life. I, I played for um, D.W. Rutledge, who's alumni here, and Coach Arnold, who's alumni from here, over at Judson. And uh, back then, you didn't want to act like you're, I, I, I guess, you didn't want to um, be a wuss. And so you stayed in, so you didn't get to call names. And it's the one thing that people need to realize that if, if, if you have a concussion, you need to step out because eventually those hits to the head will, hardly, the hits to the head will eventually um, come forth and It's an injury, and it stays an injury for a long time. Um, I joined the military right out at 17 years old myself. Um, my parents didn't drag me there, but I, I wanted to go in the military. I, I wanted to go in as Marine. My, my, my mom wouldn't let me due to the fact that her brother was a Marine in Vietnam and, and died in Vietnam. They said, you can join the Air Force or the Navy. I wasn't about to go on no ship. <laughs> my dad was a, a Navy. My brother went Navy, but uh, I said, I'm not, I'm not going on a ship for all, all months of the time. So I went Air Force, became a medic. We had our bivouacs. We had where we'd do our training for, because I was in during the Cold War up until we went to Desert Storm. Um, But I had my fair share of, of traumas while I was in, um, repelling off mount, uh, you know, off of cliffs and and falling, hitting my head on the way down. Luckily, being knocked out when I fell, so my body was limp to where I didn't hurt myself that bad. But I've also um, was in several um, MVAs, motor vehicle accidents. Um, back in 89, uh, I was leaving my parents' house, going over to a girlfriend's house, and uh, came to a stop. The, the railroad crossing I was at just had a stop sign, and um, came to a stop, darted across, thought the train was further down the tracks than it was, and it struck me, and that's the last thing I could remember. Um, Next thing I remember is I was waking up in the hospital there at Bamsey. I was airlifted to Bamsey and uh, was paralyzed from neck down. And I was like freaking out. And the, the, the technician was telling me, relax, relax. I was like, I am relaxed. I'm not moving. He says, but you're moving your head. We're trying to scan your head right now to, to, to get a better understanding of, of what your injuries were. Um, what they had did was they had paralyzed me from the neck down so I wouldn't move, but my head was moving 100 miles a minute, I thought, because I was just so traumatized that I woke up in this little black space and all I could see is light at the bottom of my feet. And uh, when I did that, I thought I was like, you know, you always hear these stories of, you know, you, you, people who have died and then come back and, you know, they're going towards light. Well, I'm looking, seeing the light at the bottom, thinking, oh, I'm going the other spot. <laughs> that really, uh, it really freaked me out because I'm like, no, this ain't the way I want it to, to go. Um, 
but but they relaxed me, calmed me down. Then they 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 told me that hey, um, you you were in a, a motor vehicle accident with the locomotive, and um, I. I don't know where to go from there. I, I injured my, my, my neck and my back and um, continued in the Air Force, kept, kept doing stuff, uh, kept, kept working. Then several others, I decided I, I needed a motorcycle after that. Got a motorcycle, had my fair share of laydowns on, on motorcycles, but my head would hit that asphalt, you know, 60, 50, 60 miles an hour, and um, received several more concussions and just over time you know starting back from when I was young they'd ask well how many how many concussions have you had I'm like I, I can't really count I, I, I don't know um, but it's that constant trauma to the head and rattling that brain in, in inside your skull um, it, it, it's not good and I, I then, um, once I was out of the Air Force, I, I was medically retired because I couldn't do my job anymore due to my neck and back injuries. Um, started getting better, feeling better. Thought I'd go and be a cowboy. Started riding bulls. <laughs> well, <laughs> more bulls I read, uh, rode. Uh, I chose to ride the bigger ones, and then I got I got busted up one 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 night. Um, got kicked right here. I got this scar from that, and uh, knocked me out. And luckily, he didn't. The, the bull just kicked me as I was coming off, and he went on his own way away from me. And so I had another concussion under my belt, and. <sighs> It, it, it's it's just the more and more the 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 brain has a hard time um, comprehending. It has a harder time to to say what I want to say. It, it, it it's like I'll, I'll move on up to to my last concussion that I received that um, to say the straw that broke the camel's back and that was in 06 and I was using a T-post driver and that T-post driver came off that T-post and it's like a 35, 45 pound weight just hit me right here square on top of the head knocked me out once again I was transported to Bamsey or it's now Samsey and came to, and they would talk to me, and I would try answering them, and they're like, what did you say? And I was experience, experiencing a condition called aphasia, where I knew what I wanted to say, but that's not what was coming out of my mouth. And um, so I suffered that for some time. My son, he went to Steel High School, and I'd always coached him up to that, that point, up until he went into to, to junior high. You know, I let the coaches coach him in basketball and football and track, but I still coached him in baseball, and then he went on to Steel, and they, I, I just let them take over coaching, luckily. But a lot of his his peers at that time would make fun of me because of my speech impediment, which was I always try to slow down to where I make sure I say the right word, and it's something that I, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Kent and Professor Coulomb and, and Professor Squires and Professor New, or Dr. Squires, Dr. Newberry, for understanding my situation, and I think they inspired me to do better to get up and talk, even though I know that um, my speech is a little broken in the pattern. 
but it has invigorated me to, to come out and, and speak on this. And um, this is the first time that I've got to get out and speak other than, you know, your senior seminar. And uh, y'all will like that when it, that time comes. <laughs> um, but on the, this subject, I worry in the future because of, I don't know how many of y'all were here last night and, and saw the presentation. It was a great presentation by Dr. Cantu and Chris Nowinski. Um, but I worry about the future um, for me because I worry about possibly having dementia. Um, it is a concern of mine because of all the head trauma I've had over my lifetime. And I just want to thank y'all for bringing this bringing this to people's attention because a lot of people don't realize that there are people out there that suffer from these head traumas and they don't know how to deal with it. I have a lot of friends and brothers, I should say, because I don't know all of them, but I have a lot of brothers that are taking their lives, coming back from Afghanistan because of the traumatic brain injuries and because of the stuff they've seen. And it's sad, but I hope y'all all can take away from this that there are people out there that do suffer and they just need to know that they've got support. Thank y'all. Thank you to Joel and to all our panelists. I think you got everybody there, Joel. Um, I want to kind of ask them, first of all, I want to open up the floor. If anybody of you have questions, I'd like for this to be kind of a, a self-led discussion. If you have questions for Dr. Cousins, for Mr. Thibodeau, uh, for Ms. Matoka, or for uh, Ms. Shicks, please, please come forward and, and, and facilitate that discussion. I'll give a couple minutes for that to happen. Um, and as maybe you're kind of thinking about those questions, I'll, I'll lead a couple um, specifically from kind of the UIL high school uh, side of things. Um, one of the things that last night as we were with dinner with Chris Nwinsky that he talked about was, uh, and Joel kind of alluded to this, is, is this hesitancy because of, of the machismo, and, and Dr. Helmer kind of brought that up, uh, it, both in the services and especially in athletics, of being seen weak of, of bringing things like this up. That there's that one aspect, but there's also the aspect of how much influence coaches have, uh, both in their players, um, either verbally or by actions. Uh, and not only on the players, but on the medical staffs themselves. Um, and one of the things that's come up kind of more recently is, is understanding the structure and the power structure, especially at the high school and in some of Division I athletics, of the amount of power that the athletic director has as employing an athletic trainer and or a team physician who's contracted to the school and influencing their decisions on return to, return to play criteria and medical care. I didn't know either Monica or Dr. Cousins if you'd be able to speak at all to that if the UIL has looked into that or maybe what your opinion on how that, uh, how that might be framed. Um, just by experience, I'm fortunate to work with some really great coaches that let me do my job. Um, however, that is not always the case. Um, I have heard of coaches specifically telling players, well, don't go see the athletic trainer, they're going to hold you out. That's not okay. And actually, that is illegal um, here in this state. So, um, un unfortunately, coaches and athletic trainers and athletic directors have a lot of influence on the players and the medical staff. Um, it has actually been recommended, and I can't remember by who, if it was NCAA or who it was, that recommended that athletic trainers not be hired and fired by coaches and athletic directors, but by an actual person that is in charge of the medical staff, whether that's a physician, um, who that is, but it's somebody specific 
to the medical staff and not based off of if a coach wins or loses because you held their best player out. Also, a lot of what she said is, is kind of on point, and, and I think some of the things that the legislation has tried to do uh, is address some of those issues by taking the return to play decisions away from the coaches uh, and putting those in the hands of the medical professionals, specifically the physicians that have to clear the player before they can go back to participate. Uh, and the second part of that, too, is a very high percentage of our schools, uh, especially when you get down to the middle school level, uh, don't have access to athletic trainers. Uh, so a lot of times the only medical professionals uh, that they have are the doctors in the community uh, or whatever uh, certifications that the coach has uh, with their CPR certifications or safety and first aid. Uh, so, I mean, it is definitely an issue even where there is the availability of those uh, athletic trainers at the facility, making sure that there is a good relationship. Uh, but the key thing, at least for head injuries now, is the return to play decisions have been taken out of the hands of the coaches and now rest with medical professionals. And those students, uh, if they are suspected, to having a head injury don't even get the opportunity to start a return to play protocol until they've been cleared by a physician and the law is pretty clear that coaches don't make return to play decisions any longer Excellent. can i say something on that Absolutely. from a military standpoint we have a return to combat policy if you uh any uh veterans here combat veterans active duty guys you can't stand down for 24 hours if you're not bleeding they have a, they, our recommendations is, you know, you've had a concussion, you tell the medic, the medic, you know, you go to the rear, you go back to the, the fob, you rest for 24 hours. In reality, somebody's trying to kill you, you're trying to kill them, there is no time, you're not bleeding, you gotta drive on. Uh, you know, one good, has anybody seen uh, Saving Private Ryan? Have you seen that beach scene where they, they hit the beach and everything's quiet and slow motion and that? That's real. Now, how many of you guys out here have been there, done that, after you've been near a blast or something like that, uh, several blasts? Uh, you go into that slow-mo kind of uh, um, uh, mindset. And uh, uh, what we're finding is that, in, realistically, you're not going to stop the fight and rest for 24 hours because the fight may go on for days, if not, you know, hours. Uh, most of the guys during the surge, uh, when they were leaving uh, the FOB, they knew, they knew that they were going to uh, receive at least one blast. Most of them got several more blasts. I had talked to, uh, when I was a case manager, OIF, OEF uh, case manager at SAMHSA, then it was BAMSI. For y'all, SAMHSA is the hospital itself uh, on Fort Sam Houston, which used to be BAMSI. BAMSI is now all the medical facilities in San Antonio that the Army controls. So that would be Camp Bullis, you know, Shirts Clinic, places like that. Um, we, we realize that we can't make these people stand down. They're not going to stop the fight and let their brothers in arms do the fighting for them. It's a battle mind mentality is a lot different than I must say, it's similar in some ways is playing football because the fo football uh, athletes are warriors in their own right, uh, but uh, life and death isn't on the line. So we, we, it's not practical for them to stand down uh, and a lot of times it's not possible for them to stand down. Now in garrison, yes, if you've you know, gotten a car accident, uh, you hit your head, we're gonna get you quarters for uh, 24 or 48 hours and uh, you know, let you rest. But uh, I would say during the surge, uh, I talked to one guy as a case management, uh, when I was working uh, OIF case management, and uh, he was uh, in 22 blasts. I was interviewing him, and I can appreciate the, the speech issue, this guy couldn't finish a sentence. He could not, uh, he stuttered very, very badly. And one thing you don't want to do when you're talking to somebody who's stuttering is finish the sentence for them. Uh, so my 15 minute interview took about an hour. And uh, this guy wasn't in the, at Bamsey for his TBI. Uh, matter of fact, in those days, we were like, uh, it was 2007, and TBI really didn't really get pushed ahead until after the surge. Um, he said he was in 22 blasts and the last one got him. His heels, his, his calcanus were shattered. The blast was under the vehicle. Uh, this guy couldn't, couldn't finish his sentence. He stuttered so badly. It took him uh, uh, just an ungodly amount of time to get his thought out. So I can appreciate, and, and being an ICU nurse, a burn ICU nurse at SAMC, we dealt a lot with head injuries and the dysphagia and the, and the aphasia. Uh, issues and a lot of that with speech therapy will work its way out, you know, hopefully. But I just want to tell you that the guidelines uh, in the civilian world, even because you can stay down, you can, you know, go home and go to bed. 
uh, is not practical in a combat situation. Um, a lot of the brothers just got to keep on driving on, keep on getting those concussions until they do get that time down, and that's when they start noticing the issues. When you're downrange, anyone to tell you, you don't know if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, four, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You can know it's turkey on Mondays, chicken on Tuesdays, and that's how you know what day it is. And it's Groundhog Day. So basically, you're doing the same thing every day. Uh, you know, and that's one thing about the military, it's, it's pretty rigid. You get up at five uh, in the morning, you go run PT, you go eat breakfast, you shower, you go do your duty, and lunch. It's, it's pretty much a regiment, uh, regimented day. When they come back and they're no longer downrange and they're back at home, they're asked to, uh, you know, the wife gets on, what, well, you didn't take out the trash can. The guy's not understanding why it's such a big deal not to take out the trash when somebody died in his arms three months ago. So. The, uh, the priorities are different for a returning veteran and healing, and a lot of times their family doesn't recognize this. Say, you know, uh, back when my dad was a, a Special Forces Army Ranger guy in Vietnam, it took 30 days for a letter to get there. Uh, they would stand you down in uh, Australia or Japan for a month, so, you know, th well, they would tell you, you know, you get off the plane to San Francisco, somebody spits on you, you, you don't reach for your knife and kill them. They, had, they got time to wind down and readjust. Now it's a straight flight from theater to here. There's no downtime. There's no classes. There's no anger management classes in flight. Uh, so they're put from killing somebody and defending themselves to holding their little baby within 24 hours. Uh, what an emotional shift that must be. So uh, I just want to stress it's a little bit different uh, for service members and veterans who've been in a combat situation um, to get the healing they need than it is with all these wonderful medical facilities we have in the civilian world, they're right there. And I would also say that uh, we have a greater number of people surviving their wounds now uh, because there are advancements in medical technology downrange than we ever had before. Uh, I would venture to say, and this is off my head, 50 or 60 percent of these uh, severe injuries you see around San Antonio, the guys missing their legs, missing their arms, would probably not have made it back to the States if it was uh, a, a few decades earlier. I think there's a question. Joel, I want to thank you for uh, the fact and the staff. Uh, actions speak louder than words. Uh, Joel is running for city council uh, at Shirt Civilo. Civilo. And on behalf of a, a grateful faculty and myself as a veteran, I'd like to present you with an American flag for uh, your service and for your continued service to the people of this community. to the UIL uh, law, why do you think that it's only towards high school that you're getting the parents informed and the athlete informed? Why not do it when the athlete starts tackle football or any uh, collision uh, sport at the age that they start, like seven for tackle football or anything like that? For our purposes, we actually do require that starting in the seventh grade. That UIL doesn't begin athletic competition until the seventh grade. Uh, and we require any student grades seven through 12, the law even specific to that any student participating in an athletic activity where it's contact or not, uh, has to sign that concussion acknowledgement form, both them and their parents. Uh, before the seventh grade, uh, those things are typically done in communities, uh, and we don't have jurisdiction over those, uh, so we can't get involved in making uh, educational materials or requirements for things that are not associated uh, with our competitions. But once they do begin in the seventh grade, the same requirements apply grade seven through 12. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is directed to you uh, just as well. Uh, I know you noted that the athletic training standpoint in middle school isn't, it's basically, there's nothing there. Um, as a UIL uh, director, are you, or is the UIL uh, thinking about limiting 
uh, contact sports specifically with football in the middle school or are you all directing towards maybe not having the contact football in middle school at all or substituting that with flag football? I mean, I've, there have been some schools that have made that decision on their own uh, to discontinue seventh grade football uh, and mostly use it as a preparation year for eighth grade football. Uh, I don't know necessarily, we, we, a lot of our decisions are left to local control to let our school districts make uh, decisions. We have a process by which rule changes can be proposed. Uh, and, and I don't think it's necessarily just access to athletic trainers and health care that comes into place when you're making that decision. It, it's whether, whether your community feels like that's something that's important. Uh, we, we've had a number of discussions, and I've had conversations with school superintendents uh, that have concern about continuing their, their program simply because of the number of students uh, that are participating. But what they run into a lot of times is pushback from their community. Uh, they've had football in their uh, community for a long time. It's an ingrained part of their community, uh, and they get a lot of pushback from parents uh, when they start talking about those kind of things. So yeah, I think it comes down to we can try to provide as much information as possible, uh, try to provide uh, access to as many resources as possible, but ultimately it comes down to a decision in a local community uh, and their school district administration as to what they feel is an appropriate uh, program for them. We offer a range of activities. I think we offer state championships in 72 different activities, athletic, academic, and music related. Ultimately, which ones schools choose to participate in is a decision made at the local level we don't direct them that they have to or not participate in any particular athletic activity or non-athletic activity that's available to members of our association just to go on with that how much education is presented to the middle school not just the students but the the faculty and the uh, the parents of the students as well as far as the parents go, I mean, we try to provide as much information as we can. They have to sign the form, the concussion acknowledgement form, uh, prior to their students' participation. Uh, we also, uh, the state requires all coaches uh, to maintain current certification in both CPR, AED, and also uh, current certification in first aid. Uh, we require, uh, through state law as well, for schools to do safety drills uh, so that their students can be aware of what to do uh, when, uh, let's say, a heat incident occurs or a student uh, has a cardiac uh, incident, uh, they, they are required to do safety drills so their kids are aware, just like you do fire drills and those types of things. Uh, we try to provide as much opportunity for education uh, to our coaches and students that way. And, and, and the good thing about being in the state of Texas, a lot of those are mandated by state law and not things that our association had to do. Looks like we'll try to squeeze in one more question here. Go ahead. To tie on to what he said, have we ever considered with the OIL to put athletic trainers in middle school situations? Because yes, there's not many injuries, but with the concussions and all that, have we ever considered of in placing at least one trainer there for a game or for a practice to help with the... I mean, ultimately, who a school district chooses to employ, whether it be a coach, a teacher, athletic trainer, student, school counselor, school nurse, whatever it is, ultimately comes down to being their decision. UIL doesn't require any particular uh, employees. Uh, now, we do at the high school level require that coaches be a full-time employee of the school district, but we don't say in what position uh, they need to be employed. Uh, ultimately, I think what you run into is, I think ideally, we would like to have an athletic trainer at every practice. I mean, because she's correct. I mean, athletic trainers are the ones that are specifically watching for the injuries for the student athletes. I think a couple of things that come into play there is one is access to resources. Uh, I don't think there simply are enough uh, athletic trainers available right now. And certainly anything we can do to increase that number would be good. Uh, but then it also comes down to a local school district decision of how to best employ their resources, uh, whether it be in the classroom uh, or in what we consider an extension of the classroom out in the field uh, or on the court in the gymnasium. Uh, but ultimately it comes down to what are the available resources in that particular community and what does that school district administration feel is the best way to deploy those resources. Thank you. Go ahead, John. I'd just like to uh, point out also that my son, after leaving Steele, where he had several concussions himself, came over here to play for Coach Padrone um, last fall. I want to give kudos out to the athletic trainers here because he received a concussion the uh, second or last game of the season um, for the JV, and y'all did an excellent job on, on pulling him out and, and not letting him play, and I just want to give y'all a big thank you.
I know, I know y'all care about y'all, y'all student athletes a, a lot, and I, I learned a lot from the classes that that uh, you and Professor Coulomb, um, those are some hard classes, very hard classes. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're, they're good, good classes to, to learn, but y'all, y'all know a, a lot of stuff that's going on, and it's some of the stuff that y'all emphasized in those classes were the head trauma. So I, I just really thank y'all for, for y'all's passion about this. Thank you again. I'd kind of like to wrap up here. I got uh, four kind of quick points. Um, number one, I'd like to thank, once again, each one of you for taking the time out of your schedules to be here and, and kind of broaden this discussion. Um, secondly, I think Joel made a, a, a very salient point that a lot of what he described with his head injuries weren't necessarily related to the military or to football, that working out, riding bulls, having something hit your head, it happens, that this, this, this discussion is beyond sport and it's beyond the military. Uh, and a lot of you probably have family members in different areas who've had, uh, who've had he head injury. Um, thirdly, I'd like to thank the committee uh, who's helped us put this together. Um, Marie Pies, the assistant uh, registrar, Dr. Mike Zucri uh, from the psychology department, Dr. Bill Squires uh, over in the biology department, uh, have all been instrumental in, in helping get this, this, this kind of robust discussion going. And then lastly, uh, I, I wanted to hand the floor over to, to Dr. Zucri to, to kind of ex explain that this is not just a this year thing. CROST is available for you every single year as students. And so he's gonna kind of give a, a little precursor to next year's CROST Symposium. Thank you again. I'll be real quick. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that this whole thing that came off, uh, we really do, it, it's, it's Professor Tim Kent. This, this is the guy who did it. Um, I'd just like to say that next year, if I'm half as successful as uh, this one has been, then I'll be very proud. Um, Next year it's going to be on brains again, I'm a brain guy. Uh, it's going to be on the neuropsychology of music, art, and magic. So if you like any of those kinds of things, I think you're really going to like it. So uh, thank you to the panel, thank you to our speakers, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.